Good morning. My name is Paul Stewart. I'm at the USB Leaders Angle presentation this morning in Belleville uh, to talk a little bit about my thoughts on the disconnect between the retirement industry participants, particularly the asset managers, the investment consultants, and the members of retirement funds, and provide some insights and thoughts around how we can get members of retirement funds to a more sustainable and robust retirement by utilizing uh, a few important strategies and asking some questions about some of the widely held beliefs within the retirement industry. I hope you enjoy the presentation. I was asked to come and talk today about the crisis in the retirement industry. And, and believe me when I say it's a crisis, uh, we have so many people that are retiring underprepared, underfunded, and their retirement is a very unpleasant experience. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Let me just quickly put some building blocks in place for you so as we go through the session, um, you can hopefully understand uh, where I'm coming from. 32% of active retirement fund members only become aware of their retirement plans five years before retirement. 35% of pensioners believe they've saved enough for retirement, but only 20% can maintain their current lifestyles in retirement. You see the disconnect? I'll make a bold statement. The disconnect is a systemic failure, born from unaligned expectations by all participants, and then sort of locked down, concreted into place by inefficient and misguided regulation in some, in, in some places. Let me just dispel a couple of investment myths by proposing a few investment truths which I've uh, learned over my uh, 20 odd years in the, in the industry. Asset managers are not clairvoyant. Believe it or not, we don't have a crystal ball in our offices in the dark room behind that tells us what's going to happen in the future. A lot of you believe we do. Secondly, all investment strategies have risk because we're talking about the future, about uncertainty. Investment truth three, and there's been numerous, numerous academic studies on this particular topic. It's not how clever the fund manager is in the short run in picking company A versus company B. That can add incremental value over time. The passive managers will tell you it adds no value. What is really important to understand is your exposure to asset classes that produces your return over time. And the final one, how many times have you been to investment presentations or heard people talking about Einstein quoting back in 1936 uh, that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world? I'm sure you've all heard that before. And one of the interesting things about that is that you have to have a cash flow to compound. How can you receive a dividend or, or, or a property distribution if you aren't exposed to the asset class? So these are four investment truths which we really need to understand. I mean, and I've, and I've made the point because understanding the disconnect between the asset management industry and retirement funds and members and retirement funds is very really important. Understanding those, those four key pillars to how we should be structuring portfolios. Dividends drive prices, not the other way around. It's absolutely critical that we understand this because if we do understand it, and we can take a long-term view, it assists us in making asset allocation decisions. All parties are not aligned in producing sustainable outcomes. Investors focus on the wrong risks, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this uh, in, a in a few minutes' time. Asset managers and product houses often create unfulfillable uh, uh, expectations, um, and finally, as a result of those three inputs, retirement becomes increasingly unstable over time. So let's try and define the problem. The first one is that we think about retirement as two discrete periods. Pre-retirement, post-retirement. But we need to think about retirement as a long-term process, not a point-in-time decision. And then finally, the way we report to our members creates an additional complexity and problem. If you only give your member of your retirement fund one point of reference, then that's the point of reference they're gonna to use to measure how they're progressing through their retirement path. And what we tend to do as an industry is we give them a capital sum, that's all. And so this is a very important 
understanding that we need to actually start thinking about how much income is enough. What is my long-term liability going to look like? And then we can start giving people proper coaching and start showing them how they're progressing on the path towards their retirement rather than guessing what the future is going to look like. How did we get to the situation that this, we've got so many people in this retirement dilemma? Because when most pension funds were run as defined benefit plans, we didn't have this problem. The shift is the focus away from retirement income to return on investment. So in a, if I had to boil down everything, that's really the crux. Investors want little or no short-term capital volatility. William Bernstein in his, in his book uh, published in 2013 called Deep Risk, uh, I suggest that you, uh, if you're interested in these, in these matters, read that book, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, he, he, he refers to, to, to this as shallow risk, um, price volatility. Why shallow risk? Because it's temporary, it's obvious. We know that the price of, uh, of any given listed instrument is volatile. The price fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it fluctuates wildly. In South Africa, where we've got structurally high inflation, um, I would say that your primary risk is inflation, not deflation. Whereas in some other countries around the world, I mean, Japan's been struggling with a deflationary environment for a period of time. Inflation risk is amortized over a 30-year period. You don't, you don't feel inflation risk. You only realize it when you get to the point in time where, you're, where you haven't saved enough money. And so given these two risks, investors almost always focus on the short-term risk, on the shallow risk, in exchange for the long risk. My contention is the deep risk, the inflation risk, is the far more important one. Asset managers often promise and imply that they can deliver on both high real returns and no volatility at the same time. This is one of my big bugbears because I don't believe delivering these outcomes simultaneously, consistently over a 30, 40, or 50 year period is possible. A risk profile absolutely bakes into the cake that volatility is the center point of the financial plan. So, so what happens is if you start controlling purely for volatility, what happens to your return? It, your return is dampened because you're trying to dampen volatility. If you focused on, on the return and didn't care too much about the volatility, but coached your member around it, you would at least have the opportunity of experiencing higher inflation beating returns over time. And then finally, and probably the one that has the greatest impact, negative impact on people in the long run, is life staging. So the idea is as you close, move closer to retirement, your capital, sum, your, your, your capital is moved out of risky asset classes into less risky asset classes. You're likely to have your highest compounding in the last 10 years before retirement, and yet you've been progressively moved into a more conservative portfolio. A company by the name of Research Affiliates uh, in, the, uh, in the US uh, their uh, chairman is a chap named Rob Arnott, and his organization, Research Affiliates, did a paper on this uh, called the Glide Path Illusion. And they show mathematically that life staging simply doesn't work. In fact, they show that the inverse of life staging, so if you had to start conservatively for the first 10 years of your retirement and go pro progressively more aggressive as you go through retirement, delivers better returns than the inverse of that. One or two other thoughts just on, on how this disconnect sort of plays out in the, in the industry. So this is a very traditional, conventional retirement plan projection. You would have probably all seen this if you've sat down with your retirement plan or if you've done your own calculations of retirement. You've assumed, uh, and in this particular case, I've assumed that you've got 250,000 Rand invested in your, in your pension fund or your provident fund. You're making a 3,000 Rand per month contribution and you're going to increase that by 6% with inflation every year through this 30-year uh, retirement plan, 25-year retirement plan, and that the portfolio is going to deliver a return of inflation plus 5. Now, what is, the, what is the first observation that you have and the most important observation that you have about that, that line? It's exponential, that's quite right, and it's smooth. There's one thing I can tell you with 100% certainty, this plan is flawed right from the start. And whether you achieve that, that outcome, or the 10.4 million rand, is purely random. Because that's not the way the markets operate. That is what the real world looks like. Real world returns do not arrive in a smooth line, if only they did. 
as soon as you start simulating economic volatility, yield probability, price volatility, you have a very different looking line. That's what that same uh, experience that I've, of the pre-retirement looks like, but with volatility added. So what they did is they took a 30-year period with 30 years worth of monthly returns. Okay, so whatever those returns are. And then they took that same, so, and, and there was an average return over that 30-year period. Everybody with me? They took that 30-year that, that, that return series and they just turned it upside down. So it's the same average return, but the, the first return became the, 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 the 360th return, and the 360th return became the first return. And ran the, so just trying to demonstrate randomness in a, in, a, in a plan. If you had your good series of returns first, your portfolio lasts comfortably to, for 30 years, and you have residual capital left over to bequeath to your beneficiaries, your heirs. If you have the bad series of returns first, you run out of money after 12 years. If you, if you sequence volatility and different market conditions and changing yields and changing forecasts, that 10.4 million in the smooth conventional assumption, you could have as much as 19 million. You could also have on average 9.3 which is lower than the 10.4, but you can still adjust for that. It's not a, a huge deviation, but you could have as little as 7.1 million if the market returns don't go in, in your favor. How do we build a bridge? How can we connect these two pieces of the puzzle so that they talk to each other, so that they're actually more in sync with one another? We need to stop thinking about how much is enough a capital sum. We need to start thinking about how much income that portfolio is producing every milestone along the way towards retirement. The way to solve this problem is through what we, what we refer to as an income efficient portfolio, but um, uh, in, in the US they refer to them as efficient income portfolios. You can Google either of those terms and you can see different uh, academics and different organizations thinking on this particular topic. But the traditional way of thinking about investments is that you've got income assets on the one hand and growth assets on the other hand. Your growth assets would be you know, commodities and equities, and your income assets would be cash and, and government bonds or bonds of all different persuasions, inflation linked bonds, corporate bonds, um, and, then, and then real estate listed property on the, um, on the one side. Direct property would also fall into that category. What we really need to do is have, is have cash flows and assets that are inflation hedged. And so in, 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 in our world, and going back to my comments about the retirement industry, we really should be focusing a lot more on listed property. Sure, the price will be more volatile, but the cash flow is hedged against inflation because the rentals that the property uh, earns has a, 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 an escalation clause built into it. You know, you can find assets in both of these components that have got growth characteristics. Similarly, in the equity side, um, you know, there are companies uh, out there operating in the space and they're tra traditionally businesses that use their products and services on a regular basis whose, whose cash flow is also linked to inflation. Think about willies and pick and pay and the, and the banks and the telecoms companies and the healthcare companies. So just looking at how practically how, the, how, the, how this can be used for, to, to help improve the average uh, retirement person. 7% drawdown uh, on, the, on the average illa. If you've got a portfolio that produces no cash flow, the average balanced fund uh, serving the retirement fund market produces a yield of about 1% to 2%. Meaning that the member has to sell between 5 and 6% of their capital to fund their retirement, post-retirement income on a monthly basis. There's some balanced funds, this is where fees come into it, some, some balanced funds produce zero yield because they're charging 3 4% expense ratios in the portfolio and the member, they, it's the, the, the yield only gets paid out to the member after the portfolio fees have been taken and the performance fees and all those types of things. An income efficient portfolio, you can actually turn this around completely. You can produce a portfolio that, that, that almost all the income is produced by the portfolio and because that income stream is growing over time, that 6.5% can become 7% the following year. Within two or three years, you've actually caught up and then the portfolio is producing all of the income requirement. And I, I really believe that, that you know, globally, uh, you know, 
pension fund consultants and trustees are starting to look at this uh, in, a lot more, in a lot more detail to see how can we construct portfolios that are more income efficient? How can we sustain asset allocations that are more growth orientated so that we can actually get people through this retirement dilemma? Okay, so we're coming to the conclusion now. How do we need to think about this? The retirement industry needs to focus its shift in, in three, in three um, important ways. We need to shift from DC thinking, how much is enough? We need, to, we need to shift from the predominant focus on short-term capital and performance, and we need to stop thinking about volatility as being our greatest threat. And we need a strong focus on reducing fees in the industry. And we need to start thinking about the world from a defined benefit point of view. We need to start constructing portfolios for our members that are more defined benefit and orientation. So they're, they're cash flow oriented, they're asset liability matched portfolios. We need to start thinking about income planning as the priority, not capital planning. And we need to measure our progress through time uh, uh, and, and you know, supplementing the retirement income is as important as the performance of the portfolio. One is not more important than the other. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, once again, fees. Uh, we, are, uh, we absolutely have to be committed as an industry to reducing fees because every cent that the industry takes out of the pot uh, is, is less for the member of the, of the retirement fund. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's really uh, all I have to say. I uh, thank you for listening. Hopefully, some of that made sense, and I'd be happy to take some questions now. Thank you very much.